So uh, our speaker tonight is a chapter member, um, Jay Hunt. Jay, I met, uh, I think, when you first joined uh, Vintage Wings as a volunteer. Very interesting aviation background. He's been f interested in aviation and flying airplanes most of his life. As a teenager, he served four years in the RCAF Reserve as a fight, uh, fighter control operator. On learning that his vision didn't meet the Air Force requirements, uh, he decided to, uh, for a fighter pilot, he decided to get a private pilot's license. And within a few years, was heavily involved in competition aerobatics, becoming the first Canadian to compete in the World, Aer World Aerobatic Championships in Kiev, Russia, 1976. Very interesting time to be there, I'll bet. He designed and built the first all-Canadian aerobatic airplane, the Super Acro Zenith, and was a founding member and past president of Aerobatics Canada. He was in instrumental in developing the standards for Transport Canada's aerobatic instructors rating. Taught aerobatics here at Rockcliffe Flying Club. Since given up flying, and like many of us here, continues to pursue his passion uh, for aviation by volunteering initially at Vantage Wings and now here with the Aviation Museum. So, uh, Jay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back here with you again. It's been several years since I've been here. This time I've got a different kind of a story. This one involves an injustice done to a Canadian RCAF officer during World War II that's gone unrecognized for all those years since. One that involved international politics, uh, professional jealousies, and even personal vendettas. Uh, it's a story that's needed to have been told for a long time. Uh, Fowler Gobey was a member of the Ottawa CHS chapter for a number of years. Perhaps some of you here knew him personally. If there's anybody that did, show your hand. I'd be interested in know you could add some stories maybe to what I have to say. I never did get a chance to know him. Uh, but uh, I certainly became very familiar with his story. It all began with a gun sight. Six years ago, when I was volunteering for Vintage Wings as a tour guide, uh, a man and a woman came in and they had with them this gun sight and uh, they wanted to donate it to Vintage Wings. So I looked at it and uh, they said it had come out of, uh, uh, well, it was the girl was uh, the daughter and the, uh, the man was a son-in-law of Fowler Gobey. And they said that this came out of uh, his airplane, an airplane where he became the first RCAF officer to shoot down an enemy aircraft in World War II. And on the gun sight was inscribed, BF-110, 25th of May, 1940, FG. It scratched in with a pen or, or something. And so I was fascinated by this and thought, well, first of all, I wonder if it's real. Uh, and I spent some time authenticating it for Vintage Wings and turned out uh, I'm 99% sure that it is authentic as, as described. Uh, and then I got into looking into Fowler Gobey's life and I discovered that he had a 26 year career with the RCAF beginning back in 1929 that had been um, without any flaws, with the exception of one 10-day period during World War II, which was quite a fascinating period. But I found it odd. How can somebody have such a distinguished career, end up as a wing commander in uh, the RCAF, and have this one black mark against him? What's wrong with this picture? And so I decided to dig into it a little more and find out uh, what had really happened. <coughs> Um, I had known of Fowler Gobey because of my interest in aerobatics because he was a member of the RCAF Siskins, the first aerobatic team formed in Canada by the RCAF. And I had read about him in uh, Dan Dempsey's book, A, Traditional, A Tradition of Excellence, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend. It's an excellent 
book. It's an easy read, and it's a very thorough reference document for anything uh, aerobatic in, in Canada. Um, as I explored the story further, uh, I couldn't understand why this black mark was there. Uh, you'd think there would be some evidence of some problems before and after this. Well, in fact, there were, but they were relatively minor, and we'll talk about them. Uh, because, uh, where am I here? I don't want to get ahead of myself, yeah. Uh, he became the uh, first commanding officer of the 242 RAF squadron in uh, England during World War II. Uh, in, at the beginning of the war, uh, Canada wanted to make a contribution to the war effort, but our own RCAF was not yet ready to be able to send squadrons to Europe to participate in the war. Uh, we were just getting, putting up the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. We were training our own uh, pilots. Uh, we didn't have very many airplanes at the time. So the Canadian government and the British government came to an agreement that they would take an RAF squadron and make it a Canadian squadron. It would have all Canadian pilots and as many of the ground crew as possible would be Canadians. And it turned out they ended up with about 40% Canadians. And uh, Fowler Gobey at the time was an RCAF exchange officer with uh, the RAF in England. And so he was tagged as a senior Canadian RCAF officer. He was tagged to be the first commanding officer of 242 during that war period. Uh, it was the period of what they called the phony war. From declaration of war in September through to May 1940, <clears throat> the Britain was officially at war with Germany, but there was very little in the way of actual contact. And during that period, uh, Gobey's job was to recruit and staff the, uh, the squadron train them up, make them combat ready, get them ready to go. From all the reports that I've seen, um, he showed himself to be an able administrator, and he did a good job of doing this, uh, to the point that he got several letters of commendation, including one from Sir Hugh Dowding himself, for, uh, the, who was the Air Chief Marshal of the RAF. And so it seemed that that part of his uh, tour over there was quite successful. So what happened? And it all seemed to come down to 10 days in uh, June when his squadron was deployed to France. And this is after Dunkirk, after uh, uh, the uh, British Expeditionary Force had uh, evacuated from France. His squadron was sent into France for a period of 10 days. Something went wrong and he was blamed for it. So this is where the story sort of takes off. I was determined to find out what really happened. Uh, that's Fowler Gobey. Uh, you notice the medals on there. He's got an Air Force cross and bar and a number of other distinguished medals. So I started digging into his whole history. He was born in 1906 in Ottawa. Um, he, his uh, father was French Canadian. His mother was Pennsylvania Dutch. He grew up here, went to Loyola College in Montreal, Ashbury College here in Ottawa, and RMC in Kingston. He received a commissioner, commission as a pilot officer in June 1929. Trained as a pilot in Camp Borden, was awarded his wings in September 29. <clears throat> he was among the first pilots to be trained on the new, what was new at the time, the Armstrong Whitworth Siskin fighter, which was the main fighter in the RCAF in the uh, late 1920s, early 30s.
So, uh, so he became one of the first pilots to fly the Siskin and then became a member of the first aerobatic team formed in Canada, which was formed in September in 1929, and these are Siskin aircraft. Uh, he became one of the initial members in 1929 and flew with the Siskins for the full three years of, uh, of their performance careers. Unfortunately, he met with a tragic accident. 26th of July, 1932, he was, uh, there was a uh, pilot officer, Houston, or fl flying officer at the time, Houston was the, uh, the commander of the squadron, and the three ship formation was doing what was called a, a squirrel cage loop, which is a fan essentially a line astern, three aircraft line astern, flying three consecutive loops in a sort of a corkscrew pattern through the air. In the middle of this, on a practice, this wasn't at an actual air show, it was during a practice, uh, Gobey's aircraft came in contact with Houston's aircraft. Uh, his propeller sliced Houston's aircraft in half. Both aircraft crashed. Houston died within his airplane, but Gobey parachuted to safety. And as a, a result of that, became the seventh Canadian member of the Caterpillar Club, which was a club that was formed for anybody who had survived an aircraft by parachuting to safety. Following that accident, and the accident was, uh, there was no blame attached to the accident. Uh, Gobey was found to have uh, no uh, fault in the accident. Uh, it, and uh, so he, he took over as the leader of the Siskins for the balance of the season. And there's at the bottom of that uh, is actual, his actual caterpillar pin, uh, which uh, is at the uh, Canadian War Museum in their archives here in Ottawa. And there's pictures, the top picture is his aircraft and the bottom picture is Houston's aircraft after the crash. <coughs> So after that, for the rest of the 1930s, Gobey continued his RCAF career as a fighter pilot, had various postings, promoted to flight lieutenant in 1935, uh, posted overseas as an exchange officer to the Royal Air Force in 1937, uh, and I, uh, was assigned to the training squadron there. Um, from all I can find, um, his career there was unremarkable, nothing special. Uh, he was considered a good pilot, but an average officer in every other respect. Uh, there were some, a few criticisms of him during that period that perhaps uh, he, uh, he didn't have all the leadership skills they would have liked to have had, nothing, nothing major. There were some very minor th things but things that would surface later on in his career to haunt him. He was considered uh, capable, competent, and trustworthy in his duties. As World War II be began, the Canadian government wanted a uniquely Canadian fighter squadron in Europe because they couldn't send their own 242 Squadron was reactivated as a Canadian fighter squadron at Church Fenton in England, and Fowler Gobey was named its first commanding officer. Uh, not, now, not everybody was happy with this situation. The, uh, the Royal Air Force Command and I should talk a little bit background here. In the 1930s, uh, the Royal Air Force was, uh, drew its pilots mostly from upper class families, the sons of upper class families that had gone to the right schools like Eton. And uh, they went into the Royal Air Force and basically treated it as a, uh, a private adventure club. They would go out to the airports in the morning uh, in their Bentleys or their Rollers or whatever they had. They would fly their Armstrong Whitworth uh, uh, or Gloucester Gladiator aircraft 
or uh, the Hawker Fury aircraft that were the mainline fighters of the mid-1930s. They'd come back afterwards and they'd socialize in the bar, telling their stories. And it was like a great adventure for them. But they had the typical upper-class British attitudes. And uh, although, uh, as the war approached, many Canadians went over to Europe and joined the RAF as pilots, and uh, were known as CANRAFs, which I know you've heard about many times. Uh, and they were accepted, but they were always viewed as a little bit less than the good old British boys. So uh, they were looked down on a little bit. They were not given the plum positions. Maybe they got you know lesser jobs to do and so on. Uh, but the RAF was happy to have them to fill out their ranks and they served well, certainly, in, in the RAF. But that sentiment sort of persisted. And when you go on to the beginning of World War II, the senior officers in RAF command had all come from that background. And so they still had that same prejudice, although they you know, did their best to keep it under wraps. It was still there. And so when the uh, Canadian squadron was formed, it was a political decision, and they were happy, the, the governments were happy with that, but the RAF senior officers thought, well, why did we really need this? Things were going well the way they were with the CANRAPs. We don't really think this is a good idea, and we especially don't think it's a good idea to put a Canadian RCAF officer in command instead of one of our own. So that sentiment into the squadron existed right from the very beginning and it influenced a lot of the events that went on after that. I have the wrong button. Now, Gobey himself was a proud Canadian. He took his job very, very seriously, did his best for his Canadian squadron and the members in it. Uh, his first ta task, as I said, was to populate the squadron with Canadians and he drew on these CANRAF pilots to fill out the squadron and as many Canadian ground crew as he could get. Here is a picture of the squadron as it was in February 1940 during the training. Some interesting people to take note of here. There is uh, squadron leader Gobey there. Behind is Willie McKnight, who's very well known as a Canadian ace. And uh, over here to the right is Stan Turner. Stan Turner was one of the pilots in the squadron that we'll hear more about later in this story. And there's probably some other names up there that you might recognize. Stansfield over here uh, was another one. So, as a, as a uh, commanding officer, Gobey did a very, very good job. Uh, he, uh, he brought his squadron up to strength. Uh, he lobbied very hard to get Spitfires for the squadron. Originally, they had no aircraft at all, and they ended up training on borrowed aircraft. They had uh, uh, some Miles Masters, uh, a North American Harvard, and a ferry battle, and that was all they had to train on. Uh, when when uh, his uh, request for Spitfires was turned down, um, they gave him seven Bristol Blen Blenheim light bombers and three more ferry battles, and that was their complement until for several months. Eventually, uh, they didn't get Spitfires, but they were given clapped out Hawker Hurricane Mark I's that had been passed down from other British squadrons that got re-equipped with more modern aircraft. But he did the best he could with what he had. He became a bit of a thorn in the side of the uh, RAF command because he was continually lobbying for better things for his squadron. And they began to see him as a bit of a problem. Um, if he was challenged, he, he could become very defensive. He would stand up for what he believed in and fight for it. Uh, he could be assertive, outspoken, sometimes lacking tact. Uh, 
And so the RAF command, who's used to people following orders, kind of resented this colonial that was bucking against the orders. So January 1940 is when they got their Hawker Hurricanes. And uh, they soon had 12 of them in the squadron to train on. And from 10th of January until March 25th, uh, they trained and prepared for combat, and they entered their first operational combat sorties on the 25th of March. So I'll come back to what I said earlier, the British old boys. Uh, and this came from Fowler Bay himself in reports that he had made to his daughter, uh, that he often felt that his squadron was being assigned jobs that the RAF command deemed too dangerous for their own boys to take on. And uh, so he objected to that, of course, and he would do things to avoid bad situations if he could. Uh, he might, if he was assigned a mission that he felt was too dangerous, he might not have enough serviceable aircraft to be able to carry it out or he might not have enough fuel. He would do whatever he could, short of being insubordinate, to protect his boys. And that pattern continued. Uh, although in spite of that, uh, they suffered bad losses. Uh, from May through May and early June, uh, they were uh, provided air support for the evacuation at Dunkirk. And uh, over that period, they suffered 15 losses of aircraft and pilots. And so by the end of uh, the first week of June, uh, they were very badly depleted. Their aircraft were in bad shape and badly in need of maintenance. Uh, he had been promised some time down to get his squadron back up to fighting strength again, but that wasn't to happen. What happened was on the 8th of June, his squadron was ordered to cross over into France and be based in what was now occupied France to provide support for the remaining uh, British forces that were still being evacuated. Uh, he thought this was a suicide mission. He, tr he resisted the orders for as long as he possibly could. But finally, on the 8th of June, he had to... Uh, to submit to uh, that order, mm -hmm. and they went over to France. Um, he, where are we? The, the squadron's operational record was well documented in Hugh Halliday's book, 242 Squadron, The Canadian Years, so I'm not going to go into that, but uh, uh, on uh, 23rd of May, 1940, this is before they went to France, Gobe claimed an ME-109 uh, in combat, but the claim was never um, confirmed. Two days later, on the 25th, he became the first RCAF pilot to shoot down an enemy aircraft, an ME-110, ME as pictured here. And that's the aircraft, the gun sight that uh, that I mentioned earlier was used to bring down. Now, for some reason that we don't know today, Squadron Leader Gobey kept two nearly identical sets of logbooks. They are in the uh, Canada War Museum. I went in and went through the archives there and went through these. They're almost identical, but there are some small changes as you go through it page by page. It would be an interesting ex exercise for a post-grad student to go in and go through line by line through those log books, look for the differences and see if they can find any clues as to why he kept two sets of log books. That was highly unusual for uh, somebody to do. And uh, I was going to read to you what the log books say but I don't have my glasses on now, so I can't read the exact quotes. But uh, uh, you can see on the, 
on the picture here, the, the two of them, this is where he uh, reported shooting down the ME-109. Um, patrol at Ypres and Lille lost, uh, lost them in clouds near Menon, uh, saw Junkers 88, but lost him in clouds shot down a recce ME-110 in flames. Almost the same thing over here, a little less detail, shot down an ME-110 in flames at uh, 20,000 feet. So it was interesting and something that I think should be investigated further as to why this happened. Um, so following and, and we're back to France again now. Following the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force, don't know where we are, uh, the squadron was ordered to France to protect the remaining troops. On the 8th of June, Gobey reluctantly dispatched the squadron to France. And for the next days, it seems to be there was total chaos. The reports that come back from the 10 day period were conflicting, uh, overlapping, some were missing. Nobody really get, could get a clear picture of what had happened. Uh, communications broke down. The uh, chief RAF officer in France at the time was the wing commander of 67 wing, but communications between him and Gobe as the squadron leader was often non-existent. Uh, there was communication with his adjutant and other things, but they were confusing. And so for 10 days, it seemed like nobody really knew what was going on and nobody was in command. Eventually on the 15th of June, um, somebody ordered the ground crew evacuated back to England. And they just packed up and left. They left the pilots behind with their airplanes and they were gone. Nobody knew where they were. The pilots were ordered back to England, but they were left to find fuel for the airplanes and fuel them themselves. And they had to start the airplanes themselves and they had to make their way back to England without any support. So they ended up going back in pairs or small groups as a, uh, they felt that was, Gobe felt that was safer than sending the whole squadron together and being subject to possible interception. And he stayed behind to make sure all his troops got out and was the last one to leave with one wingman that came over with him. And he arrived back in, uh, in England on the 18th of uh, June. Now, from the Royal Air Force Command's perspective, they saw that this whole thing was a fiasco, and they were looking around and saying, who are we going to blame for this? What's going on? And they started getting bad reports back about Gobe, in particular from a couple of people. One of them was uh, Flight Lieutenant uh, McDonald, who was mm -hmm. Gobe's adjutant. Uh, and he sent in a very scathing report about Gobe's actions uh, during that 10 day period. And it was supported by another report by that pilot, uh, flying officer Stan Turner, uh, who for some reason seemed to have a hate on for Gobe, that nobody seems to know today why. But those two pilots reports supported uh, a very bad impression in RAF senior command of Gobe. And they, they had already seen him as a bit of a renegade and a bit of a problem, so this fed right into that attitude that had been developing in them for some time. And so they looked at it and they said, well, who's at fault here? We can't blame our own wing commander. He's one of our boys. It can't possibly be him that was the problem. So that Canadian is over there. He must be the problem. Let's, you know, paint the picture for him and point the blame at him, and that'll give us the excuse to remove him from that command and change that squadron from being an all-Canadian squadron, which we never wanted in the first place. And by the way, at the time, the Canada was, by that time, ready to send its own RCAF squadrons over to Europe, 
And so they felt there was no longer a need for there to be a Canadian RAF squadron because they could handle it themselves. So these things all dovetailed together and shortly after Gobey's return to England, he was removed from command. The, uh, the, the RAF put Douglas Botter in charge of the, uh, the squadron. Douglas Botter, of course, was one of their own and a very famous decorated fighter pilot. And he turned the squadron quickly into an international squadron. It was no longer a Canadian squadron. Now, back in Canada, these reports, and I've read through them, they were in his uh, personal log that, uh, uh, records that were released three or four years ago. Uh, I've read through all of these, and there were some very, very scathing reports that seemed to get repeated and amplified as they went further up the line in the RAF. You can look at several of them, you can see the same words were used again and again, things like unfit for command and other things. So you could see that one fed another. All this got fed back to Canada. And from the Canadian perspective, getting these reports, they began to feel that Gobe was a, um, a problem, a, uh, an embarrassment to the country. And so once he was removed from command, they recalled him back to Canada and they, they uh, said he will not be sent back to Europe again. Uh, they gave him, they, at one time, they considered cashiering him, kicking him out of the Air Force, but they couldn't find anything wrong. They saw all these bad records, but they couldn't really find anything wrong. Gobey himself wrote many, many uh, reports in his own defense. Now, they didn't do him a lot of favors because he tended towards exaggeration uh, and uh, to the point that you had to question the credibility of some of what he wrote. Some, one report would say one thing and another one would say something different. At one time, and I don't know how this came about, he even claimed uh, seven kills and seven more unconfirmed, uh, which has never been substantiated anywhere, not in his logbooks, not in anywhere else, but it appeared in one of the letters that he wrote. Uh, so he didn't do himself any favors with his actions of trying to defend himself. Uh, I think I'm... How did that go back? Have I been pushing a button I didn't know? Yep. So that's about where I am. Uh, I think I've covered all that. So he was assigned jobs. He wasn't supposed to be sent back to England, but somehow in 1943, Gobey got assigned this job to be, become the first to ever ferry a glider across the Atlantic Ocean, being towed by a C-47, it's a two-seat glider called Voodoo, and uh, he was the co-pilot, so there was the pilot in the C-47, the pilot of the, the um, glider, and the co-pilot who was Gobey. And it, it was a long trip in four legs, as, as they're listed there. And uh, you imagine you're at the end of a long rope attached to a C-47 and you have to constantly fight to keep your airplane in position behind the C-47. And at many times in bad weather, it took both pilots on the controls to keep the airplane where it should be. So it was a very, very difficult and hazardous mission. Uh, but they completed it quite successfully. Both aircraft, uh, they arrived safely in Presswick, Scotland, and the crew, the three crew members, were all awarded Air Force Crosses for that mission. Now, back home, uh, there was some um, criticism in the RCAF ranks saying, how come he got that mission when he wasn't supposed to be sent back to Europe? No answer as to how that came about, but uh, it did and uh, whoever made the decision just took the flack for it, I guess. But it, that was a, another highlight in his career. And from there on, uh, he stayed in the RCAF until 1956 with a variety of appointments. He led the bombing and gunnery school at Fingal down on Lake Erie. Uh, and he uh, was commanding officer of number one instrument and flying school in Deseronto. In 1948, he became a wing commander, uh, 
and was a personnel administrator office at Trenton, and in 1953 was commanding officer of Station Toronto. In 1953, yeah, I did it again. In 1953, uh, he was awarded the Queen's Coronation Medal, and I could not find any reference as to why. I couldn't find the citation for that medal, so I, I don't know. Why does it keep doing that? <laughs> so I don't know why uh, he got that medal, but he did. And then he retired as a wing commander in 1956 and spent 25 years following his uh, RCAF uh, career, working for various charities and so on. Moved back to Ottawa in 1986, was a member of this chapter here until he died in 1994. Now, out of all of this, the, the controversies that arose. Although most people under Gobe's command respected and admired him, but didn't think he had anything outstanding, like he wasn't a hero or anything like that. It was just, okay, you know, he's a nice guy. He's, he's a good leader. We don't have anything bad to say about him, except for Flying Officer McDonald and Flying Officer Stan Turner. Hugh Halliday's report uh, of three or four years ago, uh, 242 Canadian Squadron revisited details a lot of what they said about this and, and what his opinions were of that as well. Uh, but underneath all that is this current of um, discrimination against colonials by the British High Command, the need for a scapegoat for that disastrous mission in France, and that all came together to damage his reputation. A number of reasons, as I say, RAF command resented having to create the Canadian squadron in the first place. The brass saw his resistance to authority as near insubordination. They saw him as a problem. He was equally distrustful of his British superiors. He, he didn't trust the missions they were giving him. He thought they had ulterior motives, that they were discriminating against him and his boys. And Turner and McDonald's very negative reports reinforced all this. And as I said earlier, Canadian officials saw, saw Gobe as an embarrassment. We mm -hmm. went back again. And as I said, in nine, by 19, the mid-1940, an all-Canadian RAF squadron was no longer needed. Now, after the war, his war record was reviewed again and again and again. Uh, there are numerous reports in his uh, Air Force record showing what various people had said. They couldn't find anything to nail him with, so to speak. And after 19, a uh, uh, final review in 1946, the case was quietly closed, brushed under the, the carpet, and just forgotten. Now, there's two outstanding mi unsolved mysteries that uh, I had. First of all, why did Squadron Leader Gobey maintain two nearly identical logbooks? Now, uh, We'll go back this time. One possible reason for that, that uh, and this is my conjecture, is that uh, he was suspicious of the RCAF command to the point that he felt that when he was sent back to Canada that they might confiscate his logbooks and keep them in Britain. So he maintained two sets of logbooks so that if they kept one, he still had another one to bring back to Canada. That's the best uh, answer I can come up to that question. The other one is how did Gobe come to retain the gun site? Um, it's not usual for people to be able to carry that kind of kit back and bring it back with them, but the possibility is that being the commanding officer, he had more flexibility than others and was able to do it. But it's also uh, possible, and this seems to make sense to me, that it's superstition. The pilot shoots down an airplane with this gun sight and it becomes a good luck piece to him. 
so that he was able to take it with him, use it in subsequent aircraft in the hopes that it would be successful again. I don't know whether that's true or not, but at least it's a, a plausible explanation. Um, you also, the, the two bad reports that uh, he received, why? Uh, one, there was, uh, there's no question that Stan Turner had it in for Gobey. We don't know why, whether it was personal jealousy, whether he was envious of Gobey's position in the squadron, we just don't know. But he did everything in his power to, uh, uh, to besmirch Gobey's reputation. The other one, the adjutant, uh, McDonald, uh, you might ask why he wrote the report. Well, Gobey himself thought that McDonald was incompetent in his position as ad adjutant, and he wrote several letters uh, complaining and criticizing McDonald as the adjutant. So a possibility is that McDonald wrote these scathing reports against Gobey to cover his own behind to make up for his own failings and shortcomings and put the blame on Gobey. And from some of the reports that came from France, it sounds like MacDonald did a number of things or, or didn't do a number of things that he should have as adjutant do, do, do and that uh, um, you know, maybe he was covering for himself and trying to point the blame elsewhere. Again, that's uh, conjecture on my part but I think there's an argument to be made for it. Uh, unfortunately, none of these things that could I find any re written record to support. There's an awful lot of the Kane mutiny story that fits uh, Gobey. 242 Squadron, the two, you haven't mentioned the two flight lieutenants, Miller and Sullivan. Sullivan was the first member of 242 Squadron to be killed in action when the four guys were uh, McKnight, Turner, Sullivan, and I think it's Medore, were uh, transferred to 607 Squadron on the uh, 12th or 13th of May and then moved over to 615. Sullivan was killed. Uh, Miller, when they went back to, uh, to France on the 8th of June, Miller had a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. So Gobey was not, Gobey should have had support from the two flight lieutenants, and neither of them were able to offer any support to the commanding officer. Yeah. As you say, McDonald, uh, McDonald was looking out for McDonald. McDonald yeah. was, McDonald was an, an MP, a member of parliament, a sitting member of parliament mm -hmm. for the Conservative Party. And he had a sense of entitlement that, uh, that goes along with what you've come to expect from many members of parliament. Uh, anyway, uh, McDonald could not have reported many of the things that he said Gobey did because McDonald was with the ground crews who were making their way back uh, out of Knots yeah. or one of the Brittany ports there. Uh, he could not have made those reports. He, so it's, it, that's all BS. Yeah. But unfortunately, it led the RAF command to conclude three things. Number one, that uh, he was uh, unfit for command. Number two, <clears throat> that he was a coward. And number three, that he was an alcoholic. Well, from my records, I found that Gobey rarely had a drink in his life, and if anybody had a lot to drink, it was McDonald's, because he had the nickname Boozy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, but the RAF command believed all these, supported by these reports, and that's part of what led to him being relieved of command. There was one positive, nearly positive report that came through, and that was from Willie McKnight. He wrote a report and the one thing he categorically said in his report was that Fowler Gobey was not yellow. And he'd been accused of being a coward because of his resistance to these so-called perceived suicide missions. But he said he, he didn't have 
strong positive things to do about him, but he basically said he was a good man and, you know, an average leader, but he was not yellow. That was the strongest support that came to him from anybody in his squadron, unfortunately. As I say, he was never officially absolved of any wrongdoing, nor was he officially blamed for any wrongdoing. It seems to me that his greatest sin was his loyalty to Canada and his acting in the best interests of his boys. If you can criticize him for anything, you can say he wasn't British, he was Canadian. So my hope in telling this story in the first place is to try and shed a different light on Gobey's career than what has been shed before. And I've written an article for this that uh, I've been told the journal will publish uh, because if there's anything that can be done to erase the black mark from his career record now, uh, it would be nice to see that happen. Uh, he has no family to fight for him. He has one surviving daughter uh, who lives here in Ottawa, but she's 80 years old and uh, she's very sympathetic. She was happy to hear the things that I had uh, concluded in this report, but uh, you know, it's not like there's a, a family of sons and daughters around that are going to fight to clear his name. So this is literally the only chance that his name might ever be cleared for the history books. That's why I was hoping this would become part, at least, of the CAHS record. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, very good way to close out the year with another good presentation. Thank you again, Don. Thank you, Glenn, for reporting everything. And there are books on the table for anyone who hadn't seen them on the way in. And if you're at Canada here at the museum, uh, please look for us because CAHS will be manning a table selling more books and uh, hopefully getting some uh, new people interested in aviation because uh, it's really interesting. Have a good summer.